Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, happy 2014 to all of you that I haven't seen before. Um, it's wonderful to be able to kick off the, uh, the events for the Mexico Institute with such a, uh, a great attendance here. We had an enormous amount of interest in this event, so thank you all for coming out on a, uh, on a rainy but not too cold Washington morning. My name is Duncan Wood. I'm the director of the Mexico Institute. Um, as I say, I'm delighted to be here. I'm very, very grateful to the folks from Matt uh, for choosing the Wilson Center as a location to present the findings of, uh, of their uh, latest report. Um, I was looking through the, uh, the background information on, on Matt, Mexican Americans, uh, Mexicans and Americans work thinking together, and I saw that uh, the element of uh, mutual understanding and dialogue is central to the mission of Matt. And of course, that's, uh, those are two concepts that we consider to be very, very important here at the Mexico Institute. Um, a large part of the work that we do um, is focused on, well, largely we would say a Mexico 101 for Americans or for gringos. We try to explain what uh, Mexico is really like, um, the nuances of, uh, of Mexico, so that Americans have a more uh, sophisticated, nuanced understanding of the country, which we believe really does help, not just understanding, but helps uh, cooperation between the two countries. Um, I saw also that uh, you know, this is a, Matt is an organization which uh, has uh, a, a very ambitious agenda. And uh, we too at the Mexico Institute have a very ambitious agenda with the, uh, the four full-time staff that we have. Um, our vice president of the Wilson Center and senior advisor, Andrew Seeley, who works with us a great deal and helps us, not just in terms of being our consiglieri, um, but, uh, but, but very much in terms of uh, providing us with substantive uh, knowledge as well. Our, uh, our global fellow, David Shirk, who uh, works on security issues out from, uh, from San Diego, and our network of researchers throughout Mexico and the United States. But we're, we're in fact a very small team that tries to do an enormous amount. And uh, I think that if you have the will, um, then and of course you need to have the resources as well, which is always a struggle for the, oh, those of us in the think tank world. But uh, if you have the will, you can do great things. And I see that, uh, that Matt is doing some very, very impressive work. So I'm delighted to have them here today. Um, it's a very, very timely topic, of course. Last year, we spent a lot of the year talking about the possibility of comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, it's extraordinary to see how the atmosphere uh, in Washington and uh, increasingly around the United States is changing on the question of immigration reform. Uh, maybe it's not moving fast enough for, for many of us, uh, but we do see that there is a clear tendency emerging, um, and there's a focus now on ways in which immigrants uh, provide benefits to the US economy. There's a focus now on the kind of immigration which the United States is looking for. And there's a focus now on ways in which there can be cooperation uh, between different parties on the question of immigration. Um, I'm not gonna say very much more here because uh, in a second I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, uh, Miguel Salazar, um, who will moderate this panel. But before I do, I'd like to recognize uh, Ambassador Eduardo Medina Mora uh, from the Mexican uh, Embassy here. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador, for being here today. I know that you would, uh, you would like to say a, a couple of words to begin with, yes. Can we pass a microphone, please, to, uh, to the Ambassador? <clears throat> <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. And uh, unfortunately, I will have to run to Capitol Hill because precisely the topics that are around the findings of this study call me there. But uh, I'm very happy, Araceli, Miguel, and uh, Jorge, to have you here in the Wilson Center and Duncan hosting you to present the results of this study. Uh, it is precisely a topic in which we have to think a lot about because uh, things are changing, not only from the fact that, uh, as numbers show, Mexico will not be a major source of immigrants into the US into the future. As a matter of fact, we are already receiving and absorbing migrants from Central America into our own country. And this is just because the fertility rates drop dramatically uh, from seven children per woman in 1960 to 2.2 on 2012, just above 
the US, which is 2.08. Uh, so in this sense, uh, not only that Mexico has evolved in terms of opportunities, in terms of job creation, although last year economic performance was not that good, still the job creation in the manufacturing sector was pretty strong. But uh, what you are digging into is even more interesting, which is why Mexicans are going back home, or the, other than being invited to leave the country by my friends in ICE. Uh, and what are they doing down there? And what we have said uh, many times, that the migrants' jobs des job description, which is people that are hardworking, creative, innovative, risk-taking, uh, they are so because if they are uh, not doing that, they won't stand a chance. They won't survive. But when they go back, they carry on their, the skills that they learned, the abilities to actually do something different, uh, a much more entrepreneurial sense of life, <laughs> and engaging in their communities in a very different way. So it is a cross-fertilization uh, clearly trend both ways. So immigration is a good thing uh, coming up, and this is what has made this country so great and will in the future in terms of its demographic profile, but also what is uh, changing Mexico, not only receiving one million American citizens already, uh, by the way, uh, 750 million, 750,000 <laughs> Uh, legally that have paperwork, but 250,000 that don't. So <laughs> just to make the point that uh, this uh, flow is much more relevant than just uh, the regulatory framework. But in this sense, I welcome the study. I really, I have seen some of the results. I am puzzled. I am really interested into the topic, and I think that precisely this is an issue in which we have to think together much more than we have done so. So welcome and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. <laughs> Before turning the microphone over to Miguel Arusa, I'd also like to recognize Ambassador Enrique Beruga, um, a man that I, I've known for many years, one of the first uh, Mexican diplomats that I met when I, when I moved to Mexico back in 1996, um, and uh, always has been incredibly supportive of me, um, and uh, I'm learning now about his uh, extraordinary sense of humor as well, which I, I hope that we will uh, will have a chance to display here one day at the uh, at the at the Mexico Institute, or maybe not. I don't know. Um, okay, fantastic. Without further ado, thank you very much for being here, Miguel. Thank you, Duncan. Yeah. I'm uh, I'm pleased today to to share the uh, the stage here with Araceli and Jorge, um, and I think that. Uh, as the ambassador mentioned, the, the title is very fitting. The dynamic of U.S.-Mexico migration is, is, in fact, changing. Uh, the demographics in Mexico have changed. The situation in the U.S. has, of course, changed with the recession, increased border enforcement, and, and some other issues as well. Um, and I think that the findings that, that I've reviewed paint a very interesting picture of return migrants that is certainly going to prove critical in helping inform the policy debate, uh, and especially, as Duncan and others have mentioned, uh, as we enter a new year with the potential let's not get our hopes up, of, uh, of immigration reform coming back uh, into the Congress. And it's, it's important that we better understand uh, this segment of the population, as I think that there are going to be a number of challenges faced by both Mexico and the United States in addressing the needs of this group. And so uh, with, without further ado, let me introduce briefly our, our distinguished guest. Araceli uh, Garcia Granados is executive director of Mexican Americans Thinking Together, a binational nonprofit. She is, uh, prior to joining Matt, she worked for 14 years with Altos Hornos de Mexico, uh, a integrated steel mill in Mexico, and she's an executive member of the Free Trade Alliance and a member of Quepasa.com Mexico Board. She's a native of Guatemala and holds a degree in hotel management from the La Roche International School of Management in Switzerland. Jorge Ayala is the general coordinator for residents of the state of Jalisco, uh, living abroad, where he works with the federal government and municipal governments throughout Jalisco to ensure the protection of Jaliscenses living abroad. He's also worked in the Mexican Senate and with State Senator Jose Carlos Cota and with the Foreign Affairs Committee in the, in the Mexican Senate. 
He's a native of Jalisco, and he studied law at the Universidad Autónoma de Guadalajara. And he also holds a master's degree in social development and public policy from INEMA. So, Araceli, if I can go ahead and turn to you. I need to bring this down. Um, thank you, Andrew, uh, Duncan, uh, Miguel, Ambassador Jorge, uh, and thank you to the and thank you um, to the Woodrow Wilson Center uh, for hosting this morning's press conference. I would also like to thank the members of our audience for joining us today. Good morning. Uh, my name is Araceli Garcia Granados. I am the executive director of Mexicans and Americans Thinking Together, or MAT. We are a binational nonprofit organization dedicated to leading the conversation on the issues that affect the U.S. and Mexico. It is an honor to be here today to release the findings of a study that for the first time ever tells the other half of the U.S.-Mexico immigration story. For years, the U.S. experienced record immigration from Mexico, but based on data, from census bureaus in both the U.S. and Mexico, we can conf confidently declare the end of that era. And we recognize a new era of return migration, where record numbers of Mexicans are returning home and fewer are coming to the United States. This shift represents a profound change in the immigration landscape, and this is the other half of the story to be told. As experts in the area of return migration, MAD is dedicated to making this phenomenon successful for the United States, for Mexico, and for the returning migrants. For U.S. policymakers, it is critically important to understand not just why they came, but why they stayed. If they plan to return to the United States, and how, what their experience was, on this side of the border, and how it may affect the evolving immigration pattern, and more. For Mexico, policymakers must understand how to best deal with the returning citizens. And as for the migrants themselves, they represent the human aspect of this story, and MAD is dedicated to helping them return successfully. And now, the story. In MAD, we are dedicated to working on the issues that are having a profound effect on both the U.S. and Mexico. MAD is being proud to be working on these issues for the last seven years. This cycle of migration brought 12.6 million Mexicans by 2007 to the United States. After that year, Mexicans stopped emigrating to the United, immigration to the United States in large numbers, while others in the U.S. decided to go back home. Between 2005 and 2010, 1.4 million Mexican workers and their family moved back to the U.S., moved back from the U.S. to Mexico, signaling the end of an era in U.S.-Mexico migration. But why are they returning? How did their U.S. experience change them? And do they plan to return to the United States? This and other questions have remained unanswered until now. Since 2010, MAD began collaborating with federal and state governments in Mexico, the private sector, academia, and other non-for-profit organizations on the Yo Soy Mexico initiative to address return migration and find solutions that will make the return a successful one. Mexico is currently engaged in designing policies that would address this new phenomena, but limited data about the issue poses a challenge in creating adequate recommendations for a successful return to Mexico. For this reason, Matt conducted a first of its kind study of this return migration shift to better understand the following. The reasons why immigrants are returning, how many returned on their own, and how many were forced to return, their life back in Mexico, if they plan to return to the United States, and their views of the United States. 
the study's results were quite surprising and call into a and call into question a number of commonly held assumptions regarding this return population. Our hope is that this data will help answer important questions related to this phenomenon, about which little is currently known or understood. Even if we recognize trends with the data, we welcome further collaboration and dialogue to better improve our knowledge of this critical topic. The study was done in collaboration with Southern Methodist University, SMU in Dallas, and the government of Jalisco, Mexico. We chose Jalisco because it is the state with the highest return migrant population by volume, and it has the right economic conditions to successfully impl implement a pilot program for recent return migrants. We interviewed 600 subjects in person and in debt, and it is also important to note that we have also conducted in, we're also conducting similar surveys in the states of Coahuila and Hidalgo. Our preliminary numbers in the, those surveys appear to validate this data we are about to share. The studies interviews were conducted in three of Jalisco's very different localities, the metropolitan city of Guadalajara, and its surrounding municipalities, Lagos de Moreno, which is a mid-sized city, and the rural cities of Los Altos de Jalisco. The demographics of the participants were as follows. 50% were from Guadalajara, 25% from Lagos de Moreno, and 25% from Los Altos de Jalisco. The educational levels of the study participants were also captured. 66% had an elementary or middle school degree, 24% had a high school degree, and 10% had an undergraduate or graduate degree. I'm sorry. Um, gender was 70% male and 30% female, which truly represents the migrant population, and 95% of the participants were working age, 18 to 49. Again, inaccurate reflections of a return migrants and uh, data that supports what the ambassador just said. And now we arrive at the study key findings. Let's start with why they came. The study confirmed what is widely known, that most were driven to look for better opportunities in the US labor market. Many were driven by a desire to save money for their families, start or buy a new business, save, save for their retirement, many of the same things that motivate us here in the United States. And the study showed that Mexican migration was primarily circular migration. In fact, a 68% of this specific population never intended to stay here in the United States permanently. However, the circular pattern was interrupted by a variety of circumstances that compel them to stay. This counters the widely held perception that these immigrants intended to remain in the United States, but that is clearly not the case. It is not known exactly what they stayed in the United States, and they was not part of the study. We didn't ask those questions, but there were a lot of envir some environmental factors that existed during that state that may have affected their change of this pattern. Some of them could have been border enforcement, change in immigration policies, and increased interior enforcement. Indeed, more than three quarters were undocumented when they arrived. But once here, they aggressively sought employment. In fact, more than 90% of them held jobs. This contradicts the perception held by some that the immigrants came here for something other than work. Without question, they were employed or were actively seeking employment. While many in the United States may believe that most Mexicans, migrants are forced to return or return migrants are forced to return to Mexico, the study showed that a full 89% chose to go home completely on their own. Only 11% reported direct deportations as a reason. 
when we saw this data, the 89% seemed very high. And it is one of the reasons we went ahead and conducted the other two studies in Coahuila and Hidalgo. As I said before, our preliminary numbers there indicate that the closer we get to the border, the higher the number of deportations. But even in a border state such as Coahuila, the number of people returning on their own was in the mid-60s. Often we hear deportation, sorry, often we hear deportation numbers released, and it's easy to assume that's, that's how many people have, have left the U.S. We must all understand that the number is much greater because so many choose to go back on their own, and we just don't hear about them. We will continue to monitor this dynamic as we undertake future studies in additional states. This leads us to the central question of why they are returning. It is a general perception that immigrants return to Mexico because they can't find jobs here and because they face an anti-immigrant environment. But here's the reality. The number one reason has to do with their families. Some simply miss their families. Others were compelled to return home because a family member was deported and they wanted to remain together. Some told us they needed to be home with their aging parents to take care of them, which was a very nice surprise. In some cases, they wanted to return to Mexico so they could marry and start a family. So almost 37% were driven by family reasons. The second reason, as you see on the chart, was nostalgia. They missed the culture, the food, the music, the kind of things anyone would miss if they leave their country. This represents almost 30% of the respondents. Jobs finally appeared in the third reason for returning at 11.3%. These are migrants whose families were depending on them for an income, and they had to leave the U.S. because they could not find work here. As for the anti-immigrant sentiment, it barely showed up in the survey. Only 1.7% said they left because they felt discriminated against. Clearly, the negative rhetoric was not a factor. In fact, as you'll see in a moment, they'll have a very positive view of the United States. One of the big questions for the U.S. and Mexico is whether these immigrants plan to return to the U.S. Here's what they told us. 53% plan to remain in, the, in Mexico. They do not see themselves as coming back. 30% would like to return. And here's an important finding. Of those who want to return, most say they want to do it legally. This reflects how they view the U.S., which is something we will cover in a moment. And another 17% say that they might return to the United States. More than half of the returning migrants left family behind in the U.S., but only a third of those expect their families to join them in Mexico. This signals a continued strong bond with the U.S., even though they no longer live here. It is interesting to note that most returned migrants have a very positive view of the United States a full 88%. But why? One compelling reason may be something that were that what reported to us by most of the respondents. They view the U.S. as a land of law and as a fair process. They greatly admire this about the United States, and it is one of the reasons why, if they return, they want to do so legally. A couple of other notes. Of those who encounter law enforcement in the United States, most reported a very positive experience, and upon their return home, they did not blame the U.S. for their situation. They take personal responsibility for their decision and actions. Finally, the returning migrants represent a great economic opportunity for Mexico. They are returning home, ready to apply their learned experience and new talents. Also, many have invested in, in businesses, and while they may have been involved in commerce before, after their stay in the United States, they are recognizing their work as self-employment. 
An important note is that most of them are looking to open a formal business, representing a great opportunity for Mexico to build a strong regional economy. Another interesting note is that after five years, 75% of those who invested in Mexico are reporting that they are still in business and uh, uh, on the business that they started when they went back home, a tremendous success rate. In an effort to lead and grow the conversation, Matt wishes to make the raw data of this investigation available to interested parties. We encourage other, others to further analyze this data, publish white papers, conduct additional studies, whatever will help to create a more robust dialogue on this issue. Immediately following this press conference, the raw data and a copy of this PowerPoint presentation will be available for download at matt.org. As Matt continues to lead the conversations on issues impacting the U.S. and Mexico, we are pleased to have released this information today because it puts a human face on the return migration issue. These individuals who came to the U.S. out of a desire to improve their lives, and they are now returning home because of a love of a family, love of country, and because they believe Mexico may hold better economic promises for them. They mostly want to remain in Mexico, work hard, utilize their new talents, and perhaps start their own business. As they do, and they do all this with a positive outlook in the United States. We want to thank you for your time, interest, and, and um, attention. Um, thank you very much. B before I, I, op I give it back to, um, to Miguel, I would like to recognize Dr. Jim Hollifield. Thank you very much. He's a professor of political science and director of the Tower Center of Political Studies of SMU, which was a key partner for us today. Thank you, Dr. Holland. Thank you, Araceli. I think that, uh, as, a, as the ambassador has already mentioned, I think these findings lead us to the conclusion that as Mexicans will continue to migrate, certainly they won't migrate in the, in the numbers that we've seen before. And they're certainly the, uh, these, uh, the, the levels of migration are not going to be illegal. We're seeing the numbers of illegal migrants um, go up a bit, but this is primarily due to Central American, the increase in Central American migrants. Um, but the numbers of, of mig migrants from Mexico uh, are, are going to remain legal. Mexico will continue to be the, the largest legal source. And deportations in the U.S. are starting to tick down as well. I think that these findings also hit a key point that uh, Mexico is, is approaching what some have called the return to stay phase. Um, they remind us that Mexico is increasingly transitioning from a ascending country to a pass-through country, also as the ambassador noted, um, but perhaps a country where there's a derecho a no migrar. And given these changing dynamics, I think that there's inevitably uh, going to be an impact on Mexican society. And so I'll now pass the mic to, to Jorge, who's going to tell us about uh, uh, Jalisco. Mm -hmm. or, or from your seat, <laughs> to you. I'm just a little bit. Good morning. On behalf of the governor of the state of Jalisco, Jorge Aristóteles Sandoval Diaz, and the state, I want to thank the people from the Woodrow Wilson Institute for hosting this extraordinary event. I want to thank all the people that, that showed up this morning for us. We want to thank uh, Miguel and Araceli and Matt, Mexican-Americans thinking together, for this extraordinary study, which is going to help us to understand the migrant phenomenon, not just for the people who leave our state and our country, but the, the people that come back. That, for us, is alone another area, something that the state politics has never taken under consideration. And through this study, we've been able to detect areas of opportunity that we have with Mexican migrants that come back to their hometowns because the reasons that are, were already displayed here in this presentation. The governor feels strongly about really setting forth public politics to help people that when they come back, for them to have a job, for them to really benefit through the public politics that the state of Jalisco is willing to go forth and apply thanks to these, these 
the reasons that were somewhat overseen or taken under consideration, not taken under consideration, and this way we're going to be able to involve all these people to benefit our state and in our country. We again want to thank the MAD Institute for inviting the state of Jalisco to participate, and we're looking forward for other participations that will create a great response of our, our people and of public, public politics in the state of Jalisco and, and Mexico. Thank you again on behalf of the governor. Thank you everybody for showing up. Thank you, Jorge. Um, you know, as Jorge mentioned, I think that it, it's, this study is certainly going to teach us a lot about migrants returning to Mexico. We know that those who return from the United States do so with a number of skills, um, both in, in part learned on the job in the United States, but also informal skills. These are interpersonal skills. These are an exposure to, to skills such as management. Um, and, and many times, skills in specific industries, whether it be agriculture, whether it be uh, very niche industries. And, and I think that these are certainly competitive advantages uh, for those migrants, and especially upon their return to Mexico, where they, um, wh where they have more opportunity because of these skills. Um, I think that the US and Mexico have, have been a little slow to capitalize uh, on these populations and, and on ways to, to benefit these populations. As, as Jorge mentioned, I think that there's a, a lack of, under of complete understanding, and I hope that this study and, the, and these findings will help um, sort of clear, clear up that misunderstanding. And you know, we know that this group is more likely to create businesses in Mexico, um, as the findings have shown. And, and in addition, uh, they transfer their skills oftentimes to areas from which they didn't migrate, right? So they're returning to uh, other states, uh, returning to Mexico City, maybe returning to Jalisco, uh, et cetera. And, uh, and they're bringing back these skills and, and, and moving um, those skill sets to different areas. And, I think that the work in Jalisco and, and the study is, is very promising. I think that certainly um, you, you would agree with me that there's a lot more that needs to be done. Um, but the findings are very promising, and, and the work that's being done is, is, is very um, impressive. Um, so I, I think now we'll turn to a, a round of questions. Um, if if Aracelia, you'll permit me, I'll, I'll start and, and also ask one to Jorge. Um, so I know that uh, Matt's Yo Soy Mexico program um, it aims to provide returning migrants with job and education, investment opportunities in Mexico. But what does this study tell us about creating better ways of addressing this community? What are some of the ways that, that we can improve upon policies um, for, for this group? Um, yes, um, it is important to note that this is a new phenomenon, that it's not something that, that has been there forever and people have been ignoring it. This is new, and this study just shows us there is a great opportunity to have new policy. We didn't have policy before because we didn't do it. So we have all the opportunities in the world, in, well, not in the world, but in Mexico and the United States, um, to make this happen. One important thing that, that, that at, at MAD we have recognized is that return migration is a binational issue. So it represents a huge opportunity, like the ambassador says, for both Mexico and the United States to start working together in, the, in this issue. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And uh, that's a perfect follow-on to my question for Jorge, which was, it was you staged. Know, <laughs> given that we're in DC and uh, taking advantage of, uh, of the fact that we're in the nation's capital, what are some of the ways that the US and Mexico specifically could work together, maybe from at the state to state level, at the municipal to municipal level, um, with states in Mexico and states in the United States, or at the federal level, in helping to successfully integrate this population back into Mexican society? I really wasn't prepared for this. <laughs> but I, I, I think we can work together by, first of all, having this phenomenon as Araceli said, it, it, it's new. No one's ever taking it, taking it to study this deep and to recognize that Mexican migrants that are coming back aren't just coming back because they were deported. They're coming back for other reasons. Plus, they're coming back with other talents, with other skills, with other capacities that we can work in a, in a municipal level, level or state level when we identify what their traits are and what their what their vocation has been while their stay here in in the United States. For us as a state, if we could identify what they've been doing for the past year, two, 10, 15 years here in the United States, it's going to help us for us to identify them and give them options for them to keep on working this area. And who's going to profit from that? 
the community, the society, if we have, for example, a group of um, let me see, a trade, uh, woodworkers, woodworkers that for one or uh, one reason or another go back to the state of, uh, of Jalisco, if they take their skills and they identify e each other and the state is able to invite them to form a, a company or to form a group where they, where they, where they could keep on working the wood or show other Jalisco citizens how to work the wood, we could really, really, really benefit the industries of the state with these skills that they've been able to, to have here. And that collaboration is through information. We are the state that receive the most amount of immigrants of return, and that way we can identify if we work at a municipal level because that's the first entity that really knows how many people are leaving their their city is the municipalities and that that could really grow really strong with us back in the state of Jalisco. I think that's that's certainly a need that's been identified by others who study uh, similar phenomena that perhaps creating opportunities for Mexicans as they return to Mexico, setting up workforce development programs, um, having uh, established training programs, accreditation programs, so that when Mexicans return, they have uh, both opportunity to seek investment, they can get loans, they can tap into a, a population uh, in the areas where they're returning that has uh, basic skills training, such as computer training or, or uh, office management training, and these skills could go a long way in, in helping establish new businesses, create employment opportunities, and, and again, foster this, this, uh, this dynamic human capital development that I think Mexico is, is definitely is on the verge of, of capitalizing on. Um, you know, the, the study mentions or that 95% of the work uh, or the, the participants were of working age. Um, I think it, it, we're, we're, uh, there's also another set of the population that is, is of critical importance. And that would be the, the return migrant population of under working age. These are the children, children who have been born in the United States, who have been educated in the United States, very much feel American. But at the same time, they, they may be Mexican-American in origin, and as they return to Mexico, they feel foreign. Um, they get the sense that, uh, uh, that they're not accepted. They don't speak the, the language. Um, they have trouble integrating. And so I think that's another key segment of the population that, that needs to be addressed, that needs to be studied. And, and hopefully, others will take a look at these findings and, 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 uh, and come up with some, some influential ideas there. Um, so honestly, did you want to make a comment? No. <laughs> I'll go ahead and uh, open it up comment? and make a couple, and make a, make a couple of, uh, uh, take a couple round of questions. Um, I see one in the back there. I'll try and start on this side of the room and then work my way over to the left. So um, one in the back. Thank you very much. Um, so I have a question, maybe, maybe a couple. Um, when you were doing these statistics and you were looking at uh, all these um, you know, former immigrants that returned to Mexico, um, how, how many did you, I, 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 I forget, I don't know if it was there, how many did you actually take from all that percentage of the, the, the immigrants, how did you um, uh, get to them? Like, what was the process of, you know, finding the numbers and then getting people to reach them? And then the other question would be, in that, um, you know, survey that you did, did you ask them also, um, you know, what they were doing in the States? Maybe that would help for that study uh, on, you know, skills. Um, so, okay, I guess I, it was... Okay. Yes. Um, Thank you. The methodology sample was very carefully selected. Uh, we worked very closely in collaboration um, with the state of Jalisco to the municipality level and the census. We, cho we divided um, the population of the survey, which was 600, into 50 percent a uh, metropolitan area, and then the other 50 percent, 25 mid-sized and 25 on a more rural area. We also try to um, a, to find similarities between the real uh, migration population, like 70 percent male, 30 percent female, and um, and it was really, really, really done. It took us a pretty m amount of time to make sure that the sample was a representative sample of the return migration policy, uh, return migration group. And um, your other question was the second one. 
about going to, to the state oh level. going to the state level um and, and um a, no the, the second question i believe it was about the if, if we ask why what they were doing here in the yes yeah in, in the, the states skills. Yeah. um we only presented here a very a, a, like a small sample of what we found that was important for our work that we're doing in Mexico. That's why we are sharing the raw data. So experts in other fields and, and people that had interest in other fields could take a look at it, but those questions were asked. Great, I think I saw two more um, in the back, but uh, one back there and then let's come up here to the, to the middle. I have a quick question about the... Could you, could you please identify yourself? Sure. You. My name is Ted Hessen. I'm a reporter with Fusion. And I have a quick question about um, the data on you had deportations versus um, voluntary returns. And I was wondering where you where you put voluntary removals, people who had agreed to leave the U.S., were they put in uh, the deportation statistics or the voluntary returns? Um, we didn't specify. I mean, we didn't specify. We just asked... Were you, did you come here by, I mean, on your own, on your own way, or were you deported? That was the question. And that's where our numbers are. Excellent, thank you, Ted. And I think um, up here, the gentleman with the glasses, and then uh, the gentleman. Uh, Mike Masetic, PBS Online News Hour. A lot of the data, both in the Pew report of 2012 and in inherent in your report, stops at 2010, which was the depths of the home construction industry in the southwest uh, United States, where, where a lot of uh, Mexicans were employed. Uh, what kind of follow-up data is there? I mean, has the figure, overall figure of Mexicans in the United States still peaking at about 12.34 uh, uh, million? And then my second question is, in your questionnaires with these folks who went back, did the issue of, because uh, this is going to tie in with a thing that the Wilson Center is doing in two days here, uh, was there any reference to violence either on that side of the border or our side of the border? Um, regarding the first question, um, we did mention that between 2005 and 2010, the Pew Institute, like you correctly said, conducted a study. Our criteria didn't uh, focus on only on this group for 2005 and 2010. Our criteria was anyone that had returned in, in the last three years to Mexico that spent at least a year in the United States and that was at least three months back in Mexico, precisely to have a more actual um, sense of uh, this return migration and not um, I mean, block ourselves in this period of time. Uh, regarding the violence, no, we did not ask any question, and nothing came out as we conducted the um, the surveys. Uh, and uh, over 50 percent, 53 percent, I believe, wants to stay in Mexico. So it, 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 they see their return to Mexico as a positive. I'm going to interject here and add a question from the overflow room and then hijack the mic and add one of my own. Um, from the overflow room, they, there's a question about um, the rep, how representative the study is um, in that there are only 600 uh, migrants used in the study. Um, but if you can go ahead. Uh, 600, it's a, it's a, it's a good number. Um, it, it represents the population we, uh, we tested, and that is why we are conducting further studies mm -hmm. in, in other states in Mexico. Okay, and then I know that you had a question, uh, or the survey mentioned that most migrants had a very favorable view of their of U.S. law enforcement authorities. Were you able to tease out, um, distinguish between among U.S. agencies at all, or is it more of a, a broad question about? It law was a broad authority? question. Uh, the majority of the people didn't have an interaction with the uh, authorities, but those who did had a very positive um, view of authorities. Okay, uh, take a question up here. Patricia Fagan, Georgetown University. Um, thank you for the discussion. I gather from your data, from the data you presented here, which is on Jalisco primarily, that the return migrants 
are not necessarily classic or traditional in that they left one hometown and returned to that same hometown. What you're suggesting is that there's been a population shift within Mexico among the returnees. They're going back to other places, perhaps probably in Jalisco, but maybe further afield from that. And this, from other studies, we know this coincides with population shifts within Mexico itself in that an internal migration is as strong or stronger as the external migration. So I'm wondering if you have any data that um, reinforces the population shifts within Mexico as a result of this return migration. And I'm particularly interested in the extent, if you know it, to which rural inhabitants, formerly rural inhabitants who migrated to the US might now be returning to more urban areas. Thank you. Um, we don't have uh, specific data on, uh, on, um, on, 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 on that subject. Um, through our program, Yo Soy Mexico, which um, we work on the border, north border of Mexico and we receive the migrants that are, are returning, uh, we see the a vast majority want to go back to their hometown. But that's as far as, as, as we know. Great. Let's see if we can get around maybe two questions on this side, and then I'll come back if there are other questions on this side. In other words, one in the back. Thanks. Uh, Ted Alden from the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, this may be hard to answer because there's probably no baseline study from five or ten years previously, but do you, do you get any sense from your surveys on, on what's causing the acceleration of return? I mean, presumably the factors you cite at the top there, you know, family, love of country, nostalgia, those have always existed. And yet the return numbers were fairly low, and, and now they're growing. Did you come away with any sense of what's driving the, the growth in return? Um, it's all suppositions. Like you said, uh, we have not, that, that will be a very good second, we even discussed it, an even good second study to follow up. But until now, no. It's just suppositions, and I wouldn't like to say anything. <laughs> Anyone else from this side? Up here in the front. Marie Price from George Washington. Oh, sorry. Hello. Uh, Marie Price from George Washington University. I was wondering if you compared your results from the uh, EMIF survey, the Encuesta sobre Migración de la Frontera Norte, which has been going on for about 15 years, and there's a, a longitudinal counting of who's coming, and it'd be very interesting to make that comparison to see how unique the Jalisco case is, because I suspect it might be, given that it's a very old migration pattern, and you could have returns coming back who have who have worked their careers in the U.S. and have now decided to return. And that's, that's a very good point. We work very closely, like we said, with the um, uh, federal and state governments, and uh, we are start. I mean, this is the first um, study of its own, but yes, we have uh, the intention of compare it not only with the IME, but also with the numbers of uh, Colegio de la Frontera Norte and other small st studies. Mm -hmm. And then another one here. She's coming around with the mic. Gabriela Boyer with the Inter American Foundation. Sorry, um, she's coming around with the mic. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. My question had to do I haven't looked at the study of whether the returnees have kept. In, if they were in the U.S., maybe uh, worked with a hometown association, and if so, whether they kept in touch those uh, with members of the hometown association in the U.S. I, I no. <laughs> That's an interesting point, though, because um, hometown associations have, have proven to be critical. Um, especially for U.S.-based migrant communities, um, giving back and, and again getting back to the, to the sense of trying to foster maybe, maybe Jorge yeah. can yeah. answer that. Trying to foster these development opportunities in, in Zacatecas, for example, this has been you know they uh, helped establish a university um, using uh, funds that have been returned. In Mexico has a number of programs aimed at um, trying to, to boost remittances. Um, you know, there was a recent study uh, that m remittances to the rest of Latin America are doing better, but not to Mexico. Um, and this could be a sign that, well, there's uh, less of a population in the United States to send remittances, and therefore, you know, it makes sense that the remittances are, are down. Um, and, and if that is the case, uh, then I think this raises some questions for Mexico that. Uh, Mexico has, has, for many years, been reliant on these remittances. Um, there are many communities that take these remittances, uh, and, and they, you know we know that they they go towards um, con many consumer goods. Uh, and, and so, what what are the implications of decreased numbers of migrants in the United States, and by 
virtue of that, decreased number of remittances returning to Mexico. I think, no, Jorge, Jorge? I just uh, want to answer that. Y yes, they do. How Jalisco natives that live in the United States organize themselves are through these hometown organizations, which we identified that there are about 18 strong communities here in the United States, and they all come from the same city of the state of Jalisco. And that, had, that traditionally is why they left their city in the first place, because they have, a, they have a father, they have a parent, they have a cousin, they have an uncle, and they look forward to migrating to the United States. But when they come here to the United States, they're not sometimes uh, really favored on getting a, a job, or they, they, they get three jobs in some kind, in, in, in some places, and they decide to go back to their place. But the answer to the question is they do, they keep in touch, and that's how they generate it. They generate some of, of the economic activity through the remittances that are sent to the hometowns from the hometowns organizations. And as, as Miguel said, we do have some state and federal programs that, that are used to really try to take advantage of these remittances to be to be set forth to projects in their municipalities for economic development. That's one of the politics that the governor is soon to manifest is that the state government government has never really understood the 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 migration phenomenon and all the assets that are derived from it. One of them are the remittances, but sometimes the people decide what kind of jobs or, or what kind of economic activities they're gonna they're gonna go and apply those remittances to. And those aren't sometimes the best um, ideas or investments that they can make. And that's why the Secretary of Economic Development is taking in under consideration these amounts of money that are sent to these municipalities, and they've, uh, they've made a study of what kind of economic activities are the right ones for those areas, for their investments to really, really work out for the people in those cities. We had another question here, and then another one on this side as well. Okay. And it looks like another one in the back. Hi, Vondelin Fagans with uh, Customs and Border Protection. You presented that most of the migrants never intended to stay. However, border enforcement helped them settle down. Can you elaborate on that? Yes, um, it, and this is just an assumption. Um, they, 88, according to the study, the major, 68 percent of the of the uh, population that we um, interviewed said that they that the first intention of coming here was temporarily. Um, before it, probably 9-11, when the border got a little bit tighter, the border was, I don't want to use the word looser, but it was easier for them to go back and come back. So that created a circularity. The moment the border was closed, or, or it was harder to cross, it was harder for them to go back, to go back to Mexico and come back. So we assume that one of the fa environmental factors could be that it, since it was harder and they had a good job here, they decided that, th that it would be best for them to stay here and face their reality and bring their, try to cross their family or something like that, rather than try to go back and not, and not having the possibility of returning. There's an another question there. <clears throat> Hi, John Niker, U.S. Customs and Border Protection. Does your study examine the return rates based on state? For instance, are there higher return rates from Arizona as compared to California? No. Uh, what it does is it tells us where the specific population we um, we surveyed lived. And for example, in the state of Jalisco, it's basically California, Chicago, some Arizona. In the case of uh, Hidalgo, it's more Florida. In the case of Coahuila, it's more Texas. And another question back there at the end of the table. Thanks. Um, congratulations on the study, um, Eleanor Sonin. Um, do you expect to see any other differences um, coming out of the surveys from Coahuila and Hidalgo? And that's my first question. The second one is, what additional questions, if you do get to do follow-up studies, what additional questions would you include? Um, 
I got a lot of questions now that I'm definitely going to include based <laughs> on this report. Um, uh, the, the numbers of Coahuila, the preliminary numbers, they pretty much um, confirm the data that we have. Um, like I said, the closer to the, the biggest numbers are the, the two big differences, are, and they're not that big, is the closer to the border, the, the larger the difference of deportation between a, against the ones that come on their own. And the other one is, like the gentleman just asked, the states where they come, in, where they come from. Another question here. Hi, my name is Julia Yancera, um, Inter-American Dialogue. Uh, very interesting presentation, thank you. Um, you mentioned that 70% of survey participants have been male and 30% female. Um, did you see any interesting differences emerge based on gender, perhaps to their reasons for returning, um, any other factors that might be of interest? No, no, I mean, no. Uh, we, um, I, I mean, we didn't look into it. It, it. I'm sure it's there, but we didn't look into it. Any other questions? Well, I, th I think that concludes our presentation. As um, Matt was saying, I think that, uh, you know, it's certainly, uh, we invite you all to take a look at the findings more closely. Um, thank you very much for your participation today. Thank you, Chuara, Celia, and Thank you, Miguel.